Aloha and welcome to Think Tech, raising public awareness about technology, globalism, diversification, and energy, a whole wide range of issues. Uh, as part of the Think Tech series, today's show is Global Connections, and I'm Carlos Juarez, your host. Joining me today is Mark Gilbert, the NEH Endowed Chair in World History at Hawaii Pacific University. Uh, Mark, we're going to be joined today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. We're going to talk about a range of issues, but in particular, a recent experience you had uh, traveling to China as part of an East-West Center group, uh, looking at the old Silk Road, but also understanding current issues in China. I want to remind our listeners that we do broadcast live on the internet at 2 and at 4 every weekday. All of our shows are streamed on Ustream.tv and on Spreaker.com. And if you want links to those and to any of our previous podcasts, just go to ThinkTechHawaii.com. Uh, if you'd like to join us here in the studio uh, gallery for any of our shows, you can also write to J at HawaiiThinkTech.com. Uh, I'm sorry, J at ThinkTechHawaii.com. Uh, so we're joined by Mark Gilbert. And Mark, I wanted to just thank you for joining us today. Look forward yeah, to this conversation. Uh, and maybe if you could just kick off, uh, you are a world historian, and just give us a snapshot. I mean, what it is that you do as, a, as an academic scholar, and I'm especially wanting to understand more world history. Isn't it just history? Well, not quite. Give, give us a snapshot of yourself uh, and what you do. No, uh, what, what, uh, many of us, uh, about 12 scholars, were working with the American Historical Association mm -hmm. to better understand uh, the, uh, how to place Africa in world history mm -hmm. because it seemed to have fallen to certain tropes, certain ways that we always look at Africa. And uh, while we were there, we realized that uh, the country we were in, Cameroon, uh, was pretty much a microcosm of all of Africa. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that actually 1983 starting a uh, World History Association. We have about 1,200 members, of which, interestingly enough, I'm now president, Excellent. outgoing yeah, president yeah. in January. And uh, that was very exciting to mm -hmm. be with a field that's brand new. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not uh, brand new. Uh, the Bible, the Quran, all start off uh, kind of as world histories. In mm -hmm. the beginning, uh, there was nothing, mm -hmm. and then all these things happened, and yeah. thanks to God, we have everything we have today. <laughs> and something more than that, though, mm -hmm. which is we live in a globalizing age. Yeah. Our, the pace of our connectedness to each other is, is very, very rapid over the last 25 years. And over the last 25 years, there's been a World History Association. In essence, world history is an expression of mm -hmm. this tendency of, we're now more open to understanding how we fit with the other civilizations, other societies, how they've influenced us, how we've influenced them. Mm -hmm. And so world history is looking at those kinds of themes from that kind of altitude. Yeah, so yes. whereas the 19th and early 20th century was all about nation states, today it's all about open markets mm -hmm. and open cultural exchanges. Mm -hmm. And world history is really kind of uh, uh, the appropriate field in history for its age, yeah. although all are necessary because a uh, mm -hmm. world historian doesn't know, let's say, Cameroon, mm -hmm. as well as a historian of Cameroon. Yeah. And you could easily make the wrong comparisons yeah, because yeah. you lack the depth of knowledge, sure. language, etc. So we're really a community of scholars and mm -hmm. really enjoy what we do. Of course, China is looming larger and larger in that globalizing yeah. world. Yeah. And one of our jobs, of course, is to talk about how China has always been the center of the world's economy yeah, and the yeah. center of much of the world's culture, technology, uh, science, and certainly luxury goods. Yeah, and so yes. world historians have graduated, uh, have uh, gradually spent more and more time you know, looking at China, and it just so happens that a World History Association member and world historian Ken Pomerantz is now president of the American Historical Association. Mm -hmm. So we're all looking at China for all our different mm -hmm. reasons, mm -hmm. uh, but world historians are particularly interested because of the length of time China has been at the center of much of what mm -hmm. we call world history. Yeah. No, it's a fascinating story because on one hand, like you mentioned Cameroon, you can see it in this individual small level, but the fact is it, it connects to so many pieces of the this bigger puzzle. And, you know, going, uh, I guess I want us to turn a little bit now to, to understand something about the impact of China. You had an opportunity, a very fascinating one recently, to travel as part of a delegation, a group connected with the East West Center. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like you to share just a little bit what, what was this group and what was mm -hmm. the overall purpose, and then we'll, we'll yeah, unravel we were, some of that. Tell us about quite that. Lucky. Uh, the uh, East West Center has a program called the Asian Studies Development Program, mm -hmm. and that is to deepen the understanding of the minds of educators, mm -hmm. the knowledge base of educators. Uh, over different parts of the world. Uh, in this case, of course, this is Asia, mm -hmm. but different parts of Asia. And uh, at HPU, we, we were trying to develop an Asian Studies program. The focus at HPU is Hawaii and the Pacific and Asia. And uh, I felt I could use more than the one trip I had to China a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, where I didn't really have enough opportunity to talk to uh, political leaders, uh, 
uh, other academics. But I did see a great deal of China, and, and, and uh, it interested me. So I applied yeah. for this program mm -hmm. and was lucky enough to be about one of a very small group, about 16 people, mm -hmm. uh, who are academics drawn from different kinds of levels of educational institutions mm -hmm. and also of interest. But all of us had to essentially write an essay and convince the East West Center that mm -hmm. we were going to benefit yeah. from this program. And, and we certainly did. Mm -hmm. A few spoke uh, Chinese. Uh, at least enough to get around, mm -hmm. and that affected the rest of us who didn't, because <laughs> we were picking up on the Chinese they were using, yes, and so yes. that was that was beneficial. Yeah. But uh, the the important thing is the timing of our visit mm -hmm. turned out to be very propitious. Mm -hmm. uh, president Obama met with the president of China at the uh, in Palm Springs, uh, just about the time of our meeting, mm -hmm. and that and the fact that President Obama had allowed. Chinese dignitaries to visit places like the Pentagon, mm -hmm. where they'd never been before, yeah, yeah. meant that doors opened for us in ways that yeah. we did not expect. That's and that really was a great asset. We yeah, can talk yeah. more about that. Oh, that's great. And, and you described the program itself uh, bringing together a range of different people. Were they scholars from all over the U.S.? Yeah, there are scholars all parts. over the U.S., some from Hawaii. The, yeah. the important thing was interdisciplinary. Yeah, they weren't yeah. just historians. Yes. And all of us were uh, looking, uh, I mean, the, the Silk Road was much more of a of a, of a dream. It turned out the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Chinese Education Ministry had wanted to take us to Western China, but was interested in showing us certain parts of Western China, which we really needed to see, mm -hmm. and were better off than the usual, the usual places. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't go to Duhong, you know, we, we mm -hmm. went to Datong instead. Mm -hmm. That may not mean anything to people we're talking about, but it's all about 200 miles uh, northwest of Beijing and a little mm -hmm. further out. And though that was a splendid opportunity, mm -hmm. we saw parts of the Great Wall that you never see, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, also communities along the wall, which were also mm -hmm. uh, Taoist uh, retreats and things like that that mm -hmm. normally are just too remote uh, to get to. And, and in terms of the the actual program itself, it took you throughout parts of China. So you visited northwest and other yes. areas in the far yes. western parts. Uh, yes. What, and, was it retracing in some ways the Silk Route or, or not no. quite? It was just maybe just deeper into China than just the traditional coastal. Yeah, we, we were looking at places, I mean, mm -hmm. the, we were looking really at the place of China and world history. I mean, mm -hmm. largely that was the focus of yeah. what we were doing. Yeah. And so, uh, you, you, you the, the, of course, the, there are places to start. They're very old uh, agricultural communities that are you know, 10,000 years old in China, and we saw those. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Beijing, of course, is more recently a capital. Mm -hmm. It wasn't oh, the traditional capital of China until relatively historically recently. Mm -hmm. But the idea was to go to uh, uh, Xi'an, and in two provinces, uh, Xi'an and Shanxi. Mm -hmm. uh, these are areas, uh, of course, the terracotta warriors are mm -hmm. in Xi'an, yes. uh, not far from the city of Xi'an. And uh, uh, so those are kind of the roots of, of, mm -hmm. of Chinese society from where the word Qin comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we, we kind of started in the capital because that's where you gather, yeah. you speak to uh, uh, public officials, which was really very, very informative. <laughs> and then we went out to kind of trace China's history starting around Xi'an and then moving up towards the Silk Road history mm -hmm. and then uh, Northern Kingdoms and then going down south. And really the most productive of the of our experiences was in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Shanghai is quite a re revelation, not because it's kind of the new China, but because it represents various phases of Chinese history very, mm -hmm. very nicely. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we were very, very privileged to spend a, 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 a good time in Shanghai. Oh, this is fascinating. And of course, it's a country that more and more we understand is having, a, well, an impact on the global economy, but it's also it's got this paradox. On one hand, it's long been connected in its own ways to the world. Uh, we think of it in the more recent period as having been this closed culture and society, which maybe for a brief time it was, but certainly these last 20, 30 years now with the opening, uh, beginning at least by what, the early mid 80s, it's been an accelerated you know, penetration into the world. And uh, one thing that fascinates me, my interest is, you know, in other areas, whether it's Latin America or even parts of Africa, other areas of the world, today China is a deep uh, player in these parts of the world that, you know, we hadn't seen before. Uh, I wonder if you could maybe, again, in terms of the overall goal, uh, you mm -hmm. described it as helping maybe different types of scholars, some who were probably more deeply knowledgeable about China, but I imagine mm -hmm. others who, it was an important opportunity for them to place China in the context of other you know, history. Oh, oh, yes. I, I think, though, the best place to start was one of the first places we, mm -hmm. we went to, one, and some of the first lectures we heard, because mm -hmm. much of it was lectures by, mm -hmm. uh, by uh, faculty at uh, uh, University of uh, Beijing, which is called mm -hmm. Beida locally, mm -hmm. and the University at 
PG, and also Fudan University. Mm -hmm. These are the two mm -hmm. the premier, the premier universities, yes. and we spend a week at both of them Excellent. on campus and, yeah. uh, and with free access to their faculty. And the, the, one of the first lectures we received was probably the most important, mm -hmm. I, I think, for understanding what you've just mentioned. Yeah. It was by a very famous Chinese diplomatic historian, and he, asked a he posed a question, which is, uh, to the rest of the world, China seems uh, a kind of divided China. There's the China that is the formerly closed off, the weak, abused, uh, <laughs> almost virt virtually colonized, if not actually colonized, mm -hmm. society that spent 100 years on its knees to the West. And then the other one is a global superpower. Yeah, yeah. And these two, two ideas, that uh, China is a poor, third world, victimized country, mm -hmm. and that China is a proud, aggressive, imperial country mm -hmm. uh, uh, really shocks people because yeah. they hold these ideas simultaneously yes, yes. and of course that's not as you know in international relations <laughs> that's not so unusual yeah, uh, yeah. But, but but, it, but the, the paradox helps us understand mm -hmm. uh, why we should not uh, pay too much attention to either yeah. because yeah. it is a fluid situation yes. and the result of that was we got oddly enough we got to test that out <laughs> because we're invited, uh, more or less at the last minute, and I think largely because of Obama's treatment of the mm -hmm. Chinese delegation, that we were able to go to the foreign ministry itself mm -hmm. in Beijing, and we got to meet with the deputy head of the section of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs on North America and Oceania. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Oceania part was especially attractive mm -hmm. to those of us from Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, and we had an opportunity to sit for quite a while and, and talk to her. Mm -hmm. And she, of course, was a very polished diplomat. Mm -hmm. uh, and we learned s several things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was that, uh, uh, of course, China believes that almost everything the West thinks of China is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that China's not aggressive. Uh, its actions uh, in the South China Sea are all other people's fault. Yeah, yeah. And of course the United States really is the one who won't negotiate on fair principles of international affairs and management. Uh, yeah. But also put in a way that any, any diplomat in the world would understand. Mm -hmm. And with uh, respect, of course, mm -hmm. to the other positions. I asked her about China's place in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know every country has different development plans for the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Japan works very carefully at the grassroots level mm -hmm. to supply wa you know uh, uh, simple instruments of water supply yeah, and things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was asking yeah, about. Yeah, and she said, plan. "Well, I think it's important to realize that the Pacific Ocean is large enough for both China and the United States. <laughs> we can share it. <laughs> yes, we can. Yes, yeah. but also that China expects to be a player. Yeah, and yes. and so." Uh, I asked about our civilizations, and she said, well, the, the West and China are very different civilizations, which is, of course, odd that you're sitting in a Ministry of Foreign <laughs> Affairs of a very Western type with, with actually assistants who spoke not only just fluent English, but flawless, colloquial, perfect, and, yes, and colloquial and English. And everything, yeah. how, how are you? Yeah. And things like that. Yeah, and so that was nice. I mean, expected yeah. And, yeah. And, and appropriate in, in a global context. Yeah, um, but what was really fascinating was that I, I mentioned to her that World War One is now a very big topic because it's coming up on an anniversary mm -hmm. of the First World War, and there are many books out that talk about how Western civilization almost destroyed itself. Uh, and what's interesting is that Western civilization that almost destroyed itself understood itself completely. Uh, the rulers of the countries were largely relatives. Mm -hmm. uh, they all spoke the same language, if not then a common diplomatic language. Yeah. There was no difference of opinion on what was happening yeah. uh, in terms of civilization. And I said, China, if it's a different civilization from the West, well, that means that China and the West must work even harder Don't to create amicable relations. Yes. Because if we are different, then the burden on us for understanding is greater. And I said, I suggest we have a uh, informal uh, public uh, diplomacy council yeah. that meets all the time from, between Chinese and Americans, yeah, so that, that we're not surprised, yes, yes, by these yes. things. And you know what she said? She said, that sounds like a good idea. Mm. So whether it's mine or not. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's the kind of uh, kind of uh, connectedness that we have these days. Well, China. fascinating. No, I mean this is a great uh, segue, and what, what I'll uh, we'll take a very short break right now and continue our conversation. Uh, we're talking here with Mark Gilbert. I'm Carlos Suarez, and we're on the Global Connections in the Think Tech Radio series. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute to continue this fascinating story, a recent encounter that uh, Mark had in uh, China, and and just understanding some great stories. So, join us in just a moment. We'll be back with more on the story. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. 
we raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions, and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. And we're back, and we're live, and we're in ThinkTech, part of the Global Connections program here on the ThinkTech radio series. We're talking about China and world history in a fascinating conversation with Mark Gilbert. Mark is a professor at Hawaii Pacific University, where he holds the NEH Endowed Chair in World History, and uh, recently had some great travels that took him to back to China, really to understand both the deep connections and links there to different parts of the world. And, and of course, we can think of China in itself and in the large country it is, but uh, the other part that is also fascinating is China's role in different parts of the world today in a way where, you know, perhaps people aren't always aware in places like Latin America and Africa in, in particular. Uh, you've got some interesting stories happening, and, and uh, I wonder if maybe, uh, you know, we can speak about a variety of things, but for a moment just turning to some of the uh, either diversity or, I don't know, maybe what we would call it, maybe the regional and global role that China is playing these days. I mean, how do they reconcile that with a country that also has so much to manage at home? Well, one of the fascinating things is if we, if we think of India, mm -hmm. uh, of course the motto of India is unity and diversity. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and, but when we look at China, we almost always think in monolithic terms. Yeah. Uh, part of it is because uh, they had a, an authoritarian government for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we tend to think that communist regimes you know, follow a similar footprint of Stalinism, mm -hmm. or in this case Maoism in China, mm -hmm. and that there's no deviation from it and it's complete. So for example, the one China policy must be enforced everywhere equally and was equally successful everywhere, <laughs> uh, and, and was not. Uh, there, there were, uh, we think of people who live in Chinese cities as people who uh, are from those cities. Uh, or they're immigrants, mm -hmm. but they don't realize how difficult it is for a Chinese citizen to move from one city to another mm -hmm. because of residency requirements, because mm -hmm. the government doesn't want the cities to become yeah. you know, overpopulated, and they want to build uh, secondary and tertiary cities, mm -hmm. and that's where most of Chinese investment in mm -hmm. urban scape is going on. And we can see that all the time. I mean, you can go to China, the difference between two years, uh, a city can be almost entirely rebuilt uh, and relocated by you know a few hundred yards even, but uh, <laughs> the city has changed. Uh, yes, over it seems you're, like you're overnight. saying they can build rail systems quicker than us. So. Well, I think they can, but uh, <laughs> I think one of the reasons is they don't have any OSHA laws and they yes, don't have any no environmental impact, <laughs> no statement, environmental story impact about, statement story about. And unfortunately, uh, whereas we often think that our government is bought and sold, in actual fact, in China it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. ministry, of, the head of the Ministry of Transportation, who took bribes for the lowest visitor. Uh, the lowest bidder for the uh, train signaling system. I, I was in China when that high-speed train went right off the tracks, mm -hmm. which was, of course, on a trestle 100, 100 feet in the air, and then tried to bury the cars before anyone could see how many people had died. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the minister responsible for that had billions of dollars in offshore Sucked accounts. Away. Yeah, so there's all sorts of things going on yeah, in China, yeah. and whether it's uh, corruption or exceptional uh, engineering capacity. But what's, what's really interesting is the amount of diversity that yeah. exists there. Uh, the difference in the administration of the city of Shanghai and Beijing is like day and night. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Beijing, you almost can't stop the leveling of old hutongs or old mm -hmm. neighborhoods, so even to preserve them down everywhere. Yes, for tourists, because it's yeah, tremendous tourist yeah. attraction uh, to see how people have lived for hundreds mm -hmm. of years in China. But in Shanghai, they had preservation orders very early mm -hmm. on. And even the uh, the concessions, the areas that, mm -hmm. which the Europeans European lived zones, and controlled, yeah. uh, that, well, the French concession has almost been completely preserved. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the future, this is going to be a huge tourist attraction. Yes, and yeah. it's connected, because mm -hmm. uh, early Chinese leaders who are now being recognized by the communist movement, people like Sun Yat-sen, mm -hmm. uh, 
where they lived uh, in, in, in those parts of China, they're being preserved. Mm -hmm. So there's much more of a sense that China has a history that needs to be preserved mm -hmm. for the future, and that politics is not the only reason why things should be preserved, that, mm -hmm. or at least an expanded view of what China's politics have mm -hmm. been. And so that's very interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, right now there's a, an exhibit uh, in the United States on the Shanghai Refugee Museum, mm -hmm. which is actually the place where uh, uh, Shanghai was an open city, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, if you could get a ticket, if you were fleeing Nazi Germany, if you get a ticket on a ship going to Shanghai, you there. could get there. Yes. And, and the Chinese, interestingly enough, had their own reasons for allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, they did have to deal with Japanese occupation of Shanghai eventually. But what's interesting is that these people from all over, the, all over Europe, mm -hmm. these Jews, uh, I loved the new environment that they were in, mm -hmm. the, the way they were accepted, their ability to work there. And it reminded people that Shanghai is literally, the, that part of Guangdong, the whole part of southern China, has always been open to yeah, international yeah, trade. Nice. And that uh, whether it's European trade or well before that, uh, ancient, ancient trading systems. And you don't think of China, you think of China as the closed China. Yes, yes. This is the open China, and it's always been so open. And the attitude of people, of course, in southern cities. It's always different from mm. people in northern yeah. cities, whether it's Vietnam or the United States. But always open to the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I said Shanghai was such a privilege. It's not all the architecture, mm -hmm. you know, the brand new modern architecture. Uh, it's more of this uh, traditional history that's being preserved of uh, openness to other peoples and other cultures. Yeah. Very, 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 very visible there. Very, very fascinating because, again, I, I like the idea that we have to dispel maybe the misperception that it's a singular monolithic country. Obviously, the vast size and the many, many populations within it. You, you described earlier about how you have, of course, we know along the eastern shoreboard a lot of the modernization and you know dynamic growth and factories and whatnot. But that urbanization process is also one, like you said, on one hand, it requires them to bring in people, but those people are not fully somehow integrated. So you develop what secondary tertiary cities? I mean, how, yeah, see, how does the, that play the, out? The idea is to spread out the population mm -hmm. rather than yeah. have these cities as magnets. Too, too uh, people go to big cities because that's where the resources are. Mm -hmm. So what, how do you deal with that? Well, if you're smart and you have lots of money, yeah. you leave the you move the resources out so, to where the people are. So it's a, a, yeah. a strategic so decision to kind of build housing or otherwise yeah. you know, place places where people can can settle that won't all be in one one place but there is there are some interesting problems developing which mm -hmm. is you know the, there's a very famous scientist named Thomas Kuhn who mm -hmm. talked about the scientific revolutions that is human change through technology happens faster than cultures can adapt mm -hmm. and in China what you have are people who live uh, until quite recently have all been living in communities mm -hmm. neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, they sit outside and talk to each other uh, kind of like uh, New York in the in the late 19th and early 20th century, mm -hmm. you, you have a community. You sit on stools and you talk, you play cards. Uh, those are all being torn down and people mm -hmm. are mo being moved, however, into... Closed buildings. Closed buildings, yeah, but which are right. of a much higher standard of living. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question. But, and but the community aspect The changes, community aspect right? is more yeah. difficult, but the green space is larger. Mm. So in other words, China's, China's not doing this right or this wrong. It's trying it's to do what it thinks it. is the yeah. right thing, but there's so many things that can go wrong. Mm. Uh, so, so you have this interesting problem of you can look at a cityscape from a hotel mm -hmm. and you can watch half a city being demolished mm -hmm. to make way for the new, new the systems, new, system, new buildings. Yeah. And then on the horizon you can see all the new housing developments uh, that are being built uh, which people are supposed to fill. Mm -hmm. And you look at it and you try to remain objective. And I did. I spent some time with probably the mm -hmm. leading urban planner in China and we were walking home from dinner and I said, you know, the problem in the West when we do these kinds of things is we gentrify the city center and push all the poor out of the city into the suburbs where their quality of life may be actually better, cleaner air, mm -hmm. whatever it is, but the idea is they don't, they're not able to sustain the contacts with themselves or with the elites that begin occupying the cities, and the elites become uh, uh, siloed into their own society mm -hmm. inside the mm -hmm. city center. And he, we were walking, I'll never forget this, we were walking along and he said, the rich always shaft the poor. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the way it the is. Way it is and, and of course, I'm in a mm. communist country, yeah. and, and these are this is a man who was raised during the Cultural Revolution, mm. and they've come to accept essentially the same kind of acceptance that we have, that development here in Hawaii, even, yeah. that development is inevitable, and we, yeah, we're so looking past the right. consequences. Because yeah. the consequences are quite serious in China. Imagine if you have a plan to build millions of apartments mm -hmm. and literally thousands of apartment buildings all which have elevators all of those elevators have to be maintained mm -hmm. 
at a very high standard for these buildings to be. Yeah. The same thing goes with high, you know, train systems and mm -hmm. transportation. Yeah, yeah. So China's enjoying a great deal of wealth now because they're the manufacturing hub of the world. Mm -hmm. But if anything affects that, that, that success, uh, it will be felt all throughout Chinese society like mm -hmm. a kind of earthquake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I like to tell my students, if China succeeds in what it's doing, uh, the rest of the world better watch out. Yeah. If China fails at what it's doing, we, the rest of the world we, better watch we, out. And we will know. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's a fascinating uh, contradiction of sorts. Well, what I'm reminded, I, I had a chance to visit a couple about five, six years ago. Now I've had two trips to China, and I'll never forget how shocked I was that, you know, I had grown up reading a lot of the history and, you know, sort of had my understanding of it. And then I've had a number of students myself over the years until you go and actually see the world that they're growing up in. This is not the China of their parents or grandparents, and it's just, a, a, I mean, mind-boggling how quickly it's transformed, and this paradox of modernity, it's there in so many ways, and yet a very traditional society, very you know, long, hit, hit, rich history. The other thing that struck me, especially from a lot of travels I do in the developing world, um, not a lot of small children, and when you saw one, it was usually the child that was kind of, you know, comforted with either two parents or four grandparents and a legacy of this now gosh 30 plus years of a mm -hmm. one-child policy and th that has constantly boggled me you know what does that mean for a society that you know uh, for one I, I come from a world where I've got a lot of children I come from big families and growing up as a single child and that's the world for many of, of, of the Chinese families what does that do to a society you know you know socializing takes on a different dimension uh, on one hand uh, the other of course what it does is that the parents and the grandparents are putting a lot investing a lot in that child and, and obviously their future depends on that uh, any thoughts about <laughs> oh, what sure. you saw oh, in yes, that yes, social? We were very very lucky uh, uh, we, when we were in Shanghai we took a, a, a trip out to uh, Suzhou mm -hmm. and uh, to a kind of model hospice care retirement mm -hmm. center, which is probably the best one in southern China. It may be the best one in all of China. Mm -hmm. And of course, because it was in essence a model, that this bill, everything was to the highest standard. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, a lot of us were thinking, gee, maybe my parents can move here. <laughs> you know, but of course, as we explored the situation more closely, uh, things were not as rosy. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly as, uh, what would they call them? Potemkin villages? Mm -hmm. it, it was wonderful. And mm -hmm. the staff deeply and sincerely committed to what they were doing. But the problem that struck me in China was not the lack of children. It was the problem, as you've noticed actually with children, it's the, the growing number of elderly. Mm -hmm. That one of the biggest problems in developing countries now is actually yeah, yeah. Uh, that they're dealing with a uh, large aging population. population uh, it's what's India's great advantage yeah. in the world because mm -hmm. its population is very young, mm -hmm. but in China it's getting very old. Yeah. And so we went to this site and we found you know many people with Alzheimer's, uh, you know all sorts of other kinds of things that get mm -hmm. you in hospices and, and, and terminal care areas. But they also had a ladies who lunch uh, function mm -hmm. at a wonderful kind of facility where elderly parents could be dropped off by their kids. So, you know, kids would go to work and they would uh, you know play mahjong mm -hmm. and you know and have a nice day. Of course, they were very well dressed, and we felt maybe for us, you know. But but on the other hand, also this is obviously a typical thing. Mm -hmm. But that made us ask some very very interesting questions, mm -hmm. which is who's paying for this? Yeah, yeah. Because in almost all former communist countries, they're delinking social spending. Mm -hmm. They're re they're uh, returning the cost of uh, like here in the United States, yeah. uh, students so, are paying more and more for their own education, yeah, less and less yeah, state supported, so yeah. and that's happening yeah. in China too. Mm -hmm. But in but what about what about about social services, and it turns out the Chinese government has introduced a kind of thing. It's called the 10 1090 plan. But the idea is that people are expected to pay at least 10 percent. Mm, you know, the government. Yeah, I think the government's paying 10 percent. People are taking a greater and greater percentage of mm -hmm. the, you know, the social welfare system, mm -hmm. and they'll be paying for it. Now, in a growing, obviously, in a growing economy, in which anyone who wants to work hard, etc., has an opportunity to do so. Uh, you know, they, they shouldn't complain much. Yeah. But they are complaining because yeah. their view of the elderly has changed. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, changed it from the elderly being the sum total of what your life should be, taking care of your parents, yeah. filial piety. Yeah. And now there's, it's like, oh, oh they're in my bank account. All of a sudden, yeah. yeah, yeah yes, exactly. a, new, a new definition a new of definition. What, what filial piety yeah, means. Exactly. Well, fascinating. We're going to take another short break right now and uh, continue this great conversation we have with Mark Gilbert. I'm Carlos Juarez. This is Global Connections in the Think Tech radio series. Uh, and we're joined by Mark Gilbert, who's uh, helping us explore a range of issues, particularly regarding China, this country that is so vast and, and diverse and, and changing 
geographically we need to understand and for those of you who have not had an opportunity I would encourage you get on a plane it's a you know hop uh, and it will change your worldview of it it's very important for us to understand that and we'll continue this conversation we'll be back in just a minute so stay tuned for more on the story I'm Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. We do monthly luncheon programs with ThinkTech about things that matter to Hawaii entrepreneurs, investors, and business service providers. So join us on the fourth Thursday of every month at the Plaza Club. For information about upcoming events or to join our mailing list, visit hvca.org. See you there. Aloha, and we're back, we're live, and we're ThinkTech uh, here in the ThinkTech series. Global Connections is our show, and I'm Carlos Juarez. We're joined today by Mark Gilbert, having a great conversation about China. And again, uh, you know, a country in tremendous transition, but also this rich historical heritage diversity. And one of the things that maybe I wanted to turn attention to right now, um, we don't often associate it or think about it for a country like China, and that is religion. Uh, you know, here's a country that, of course, for many, many decades as a communist state, religion was something that you probably didn't think of, but nevertheless today in the more open, global, interconnected China that it is, what's going on? What can you share with us about religion and its manifestation in China? Well, it, it, it's kind of interesting because first of all, if you asked a Chinese government official about religion, they, 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 they would say, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and if you said Confucianism, he'd say, well, that's not a religion. Yeah. And of course, Confucius would have agreed. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, uh, the idea really are philosophical systems, mm -hmm. and and the Chinese government, uh, being a, a secular communist regime, uh, has uh, you know tried to turn its back uh, to uh, that element of Chinese life uh, during the course of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Now it's seeing the the touristic possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as uh, religions, uh, formal religions, accept leadership appointed by the Chinese government. Uh, like the Catholic Church or Buddhist mm -hmm. sects, uh, they don't represent a threat to the state. Mm -hmm. And as long as they're not a threat to the state, the, the Chinese government is is interesting, yeah, is tolerant, extending opposite, very tolerant, yeah. and extending uh, extending support for them. Uh, the interesting thing for our trip, uh, well, I think two things. First, uh, in Beijing, there's a lamasery that uh, almost is on everybody's. Uh, uh, tourist uh, mm -hmm. agenda. Unfortunately, not too far away is a really fantastic Confucian temple, mm -hmm. but people don't get down that street. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the the this uh, lamasery uh, is a is a very beautiful Buddhist complex mm -hmm. in which you will find Chinese of all walks of life burning incense mm -hmm. and praying. Mm -hmm. And of course, you ask you know if you ask a official, they'd they'd explain it this way. That you know, life is uncertain, mm -hmm. and uh, you're always looking for loopholes <laughs> and looking for external support. So it's not going to hurt to invest a, a few yuan and you know whatever mm -hmm. in, in uh, burn some incense, yeah, put yes, a throw burn a some incense, do things like yeah. that. But uh, I think there's probably more to it than that, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, because of neighborhood re relocations mm -hmm. and all these things, people they are resettled. There is an opening for religion in, in mm -hmm. China again. Mm -hmm. I think the Chinese government would prefer it would be something very Confucian because mm -hmm. Confucianism is a rationalist faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the values of Confucianism are about obedience. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, again, filial piety. These mm -hmm. are positive mm -hmm. things, loyalty. Mm -hmm. These are things you want to encourage uh, uh, people in. And I can see that developing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there is Falun Gong. You know, there, yeah. there, no, there are religious movements. Yes, because times. they represent an alternative yes. source of authority. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, Tibetan Buddhism is a threat because mm -hmm. the Chinese government hasn't really managed to find a way of controlling mm -hmm. uh, or putting its emperor maturity yeah. on top mm -hmm. of uh, Tibetan uh, religion. But uh, the, the idea is that uh, wherever you would go, there would always be people sincerely interested in expressing you know, religious feelings. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, during the during the in Soviet Union, uh, supposedly the secularist communist mm -hmm. state, the churches were open all the time and mm -hmm. people went all the time. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's one of those myths, just as yeah. uh, China's closed, uh, China's uniform, uh, in actual fact, China's uh, open. People forget that almost all Chinese dynasties were started 
uh, by foreigners on the frontier that were collapsing the empire, yeah. and rather than from you know, Han people's uh, internal running the, yeah, their yeah, internal yeah. interests. And, and so that was a pleasure to get out to uh, Wu Tai Shan, mm. uh, which was a, uh, a Buddhist and Taoist temple complex mm -hmm. in the northwest of China. And it was like Disneyland. It was so full mm. of Chinese tourists mm -hmm. burning incense, uh, singing Buddhist, uh, you know, familiar chants to mm -hmm. anyone who's been to Korea, mm -hmm. you know, uh, singing very familiar Mahayana Buddhist chants. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a lot of life in, in yeah. religion in China today. Well, it's almost as if maybe with these dramatic changes and, in, in, you know, well, just the, the uncertain, uncertainty of those changes, but also one could also say maybe even challenges like you know inequalities the growth of a you know new class people may be asking you know how do we make sense of this or you know maybe uh, another way of putting yeah. it is that there's a place for religion maybe more rather than in a society previously that was more tightly controlled maybe uh, i would be curious to think uh, from your perspective how much is this greater openness and and connectedness that china has today are there ideas that are coming in any easier or or is this you know role of religion still more just only internal or are they well, getting it's any not impact? just religion i think in other words anything that's, that's outside of the orthodoxy okay the, the problem is the orthodoxy of the cultural revolution is gone yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, I don't see the communi I, th I could see the Communist Party disappearing tomorrow and it having no impact on China at all. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. see people, and this is actually true in part in Vietnam as well, mm -hmm. that the, the, the party politics are, are all about self-interest. And uh, there's enough opportunity outside of the party that you can, you can be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, whereas before people looked to the Communist Party for uh, their social welfare mm -hmm. and all these, and there are elements of the Chinese Communist Party uh, that are devoted to welfare. There's a very a very unknown unit really in China that delayed the, the Three Gorges Dam project mm -hmm. on the basis of on humanitarian grounds. So mm -hmm. there, there, there's a lot more uh, flexibility and openness than, than we'd actually see. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's fascinating is just people making their own way. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the, uh, the Three Gorges project might be a way of kind of summing that up. When I was in China a couple of years ago, uh, because I was with a particular kind of group with very good relations with the Chinese government and also uh, develop self-help and development NGOs. Mm -hmm. And so we got to one of these uh, cities, the new cities, that were built above the old cities which are now underwater. And when they were making when the dam. When they were making, making just, the just dam and created, the reservoir yes. was created. And uh, we got to speak to people uh, who lived in the new cities. Uh, and uh, you know, we asked them, well, you know, for us what we think in the West is people didn't get the homes they were promised. Mm -hmm. Party members did. Mm -hmm. And that was true to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Mm -hmm. But not any of the people we spoke to. Now, of course, they're chosen. Yeah. You know, they're, yeah. But they're chosen in the sense that they're reliable people, that they're, mm -hmm. they're not going to say or do anything <laughs> stupid, rather than there's a script for them to follow. Yeah, okay. And uh, so we're sitting on the floor of this woman's house. Her little kid runs in with a M16, a plastic, a plastic model, toy. right? Mm -hmm. Plastic toy, living a perfectly Western kid's life <laughs> in the those limited way of looking at it. But she said, you know, some people got the money for, for relocating. They made the right decisions with that money. Uh, they built their houses over shops. They got there because if they were good business people, they were economically successful. He says other people just collapsed. They, they yeah, drank or, or they made the wrong decision. And this is always true of Chinese mm. society, uh, that they made wrong decisions. <laughs> so in other words, there is a system out there. It may be not working for you anymore, mm -hmm. but there's space inside that system for you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the reason why China is as quiescent as it is now uh, it is in part because people really do have faith that the next generation is going to be better off. Mm -hmm. And that's really was the glue that I think that holds yeah. people together. Yeah. But the Chinese government realizes that this is not kind of one-way street, mm -hmm. and they've been allowing wages to rise because that's about the only thing that will keep people you know, happy keep, keep because they're well. aware mm -hmm. because of the internet and you know there's the yeah. Weibo you know there, there's yeah. there's subterranean internet mm -hmm. you know within China and they can't keep the world from from the Chinese people and of course the, Chi the Soviet Union collapsed because of what we call China markets that is Russians could go to markets that were filled with black market uh, export from China that was spare from going to the United States. Mm -hmm. So now they realize not only was the United States had a higher standard of living, but even the Chinese do because <laughs> they have access to that stuff. And they, we're, and the we're Russians don't. Yes, uh, we're buying their stock. leavings exactly. Oh, so, so I think there's a lot of tension within Chinese society. But right now, especially with the ability to count on nationalism, mm -hmm. especially in the South China Sea and these island issues with Japan, mm -hmm. it's a way of really ratcheting up 
loyalty to the government mm -hmm. at a time where people really are not that confident mm -hmm. in the government, which is a similar pattern. Yeah, well, fascinating. States. Well, we're going to take a final short break, and we'll be back in just a short moment. I'm Carlos Juarez. This is Global Connections in the Think Tech Radio Series, and we're talking with Mark Gilbert uh, about a wide range of issues related to China and its growing connectedness to the outside world. We'll be back in just a minute, so stay tuned for more of the story. to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. And we're back and we're live and we're ThinkTech. This is Global Connections in the ThinkTech radio series. We're joined by Mark Gilbert and going to continue our conversation here about China. Some great observations. You had a visit this uh, recently uh, in, in part of a delegation from the East-West Center that looked at really the changing dynamics. Uh, uh, the, you know, the, what was it? the formal title was the Silk Road. Uh, no, it's actually it was really about Western uh, China and the West. China and the West. Meaning yes. China's relationship with Western civilization, mm -hmm. but also with its own West. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. The pipelines, yeah, the oil, yeah, yeah. and all the development occurring in the West. Quite amazing. And you know, one of the things that struck me is, you know, again, we often have this perception China, communist state, controlling information and uh, particularly things like with the technologies we have now related to, say, the internet and access. I mean, it's a place where I think, and wonder what you can share about this, I mean, mm -hmm. people there have very innovative ways to somehow get around that, uh, that is, the government may, may wish to control and limit uh, information or, or want to control the narrative. Uh, but the Chinese are ingenious and, and have ways uh, under these technologies. Uh, anything you can share about that or oh, observations? Yes, yes. Uh, two years ago when I was in China, as I mentioned earlier, I was in southern China when uh, there was a train derailment, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, later uh, attributed to, what is it, lowest bid signals that were <laughs> set up. And the Chinese, when it happened, uh, the Chinese government, first of all, tried to pretend it didn't happen. Uh, that it was lightning struck the signals, uh, <laughs> that uh, all sorts of uh, minimizing what had happened. Mm -hmm. But but farmers around the track had all run out with their cell phones yes, yes. And, and took pictures of it. So it was very hard to Suddenly, for the government to, yes. to, to defend itself. And what was interesting is that uh, the communist uh, organs, the newspapers, mm -hmm. all had to criticize the government <laughs> because it was impossible to keep the truth of the failure, yeah. which was corruption had led to this low bid yeah. uh, signaling mm -hmm. system, which of course must be common throughout the high speed train network, yes. which is frightening. I mean, it's a wonderful train system yeah, yeah, and getting better all the time, but still it's rather frightening. And then it turned out that the transportation minister was, was eventually tried for horrendous corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is that the newspapers, in other words, had but to follow the be. information. Mm -hmm. It was not possible for the Chinese government to contain the story. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's what, uh, uh, all our recent NSA stuff is about, you know, in a way we're learning not so much that the government knows so much about what we're doing, but that there's so much information out there. What mm -hmm. do you need to know and, and, and what do you not? not? Yeah. What is it? What What is entitled to privacy, uh, under privacy, and what is not? And so they're having that debate too in China, which really does say a lot about globalization. Yeah. But there are activists, we, we met an activist when I was in China, who really believes that uh, Interesting, you can sample all the electronic media that you want. Uh, mm -hmm. Langley, for example, can li read every single email. I know they read one of mine, which is a very <laughs> funny story, but not, not appropriate here. But the idea is that, that they can read everything, but they neither have the skill nor the talent nor the desire to control everything because they can't. It mm. requires too, too much staff, too big, big expense. <laughs> so in actual fact, if you really just want to do things on your own that don't threaten the state and you keep a low profile, you can use the internet. Mm. 
you know, very effectively to uh, uh, further not just your own economic interests, but national interests. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as the state is respected, uh, and the state doesn't, doesn't have enough time to watch everyone, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the result is you can actually, they, they're, they're very confident. There, yeah. uh, I mean, we uh, sitting around listening to these activists said, you know, you, you, you're fooling yourself. I mean, <laughs> coming from a society we now know is much more regulated, mm -hmm. but we're academics, we knew that, you know, before, <laughs> that there's a great, a great deal of surveillance. Uh, but they also, they also were very, that wonderful, naive feeling that mm -hmm. true reformers have, mm -hmm. that, that Americans have become so cynical about. You know, and you know, all our heroes have feet of clay. You know, <laughs> our feet of clay, so they we, we don't have to listen to anybody, uh, and they get way too cynical. But in China, there are people who are not cynical, yeah. and uh, who don't feel hatred towards their government or any other, but really want to move China forward yeah. to yeah. what they see as a freer society. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. Now, the other thing I'm curious, um, you know, having recently been there and, and seen different parts, I mean, China is experiencing obviously demographic changes on many levels. Uh, aging society, you know, the but also this, perhaps the disparity of a growing, you know, elite and you know, sort of well-to-do class, and and what we see it reflected now in terms of growing numbers of tourists, more Chinese than ever. I've been in parts of Europe where suddenly busloads of Chinese show up, or even a college tour this past summer, you know, huge busload of Chinese just show up suddenly. Uh, there. But this Chinese, you know, let's say wealth um, and, and growing tourism is happening also within China. So tell us a little bit about maybe what you saw or, or related to Chinese tourism within China itself. Well, what's interesting is, you know, that, that, that this is so wonderful for people who are interested in tourist management. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Hawaii, we always are. That's right, yeah. uh, But the Chinese government originally, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, it looked at uh, pilgrimage sites of cultural tourism for Chinese mm -hmm. because. Uh, Chinese poets would go to a beautiful place and write a splendid poem about mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. and then people would all want to come to that to, place to see, to it, see yes, it. Yes. And and that was considered bourgeois. <laughs> that was too artsy, and so uh, they discouraged that kind mm -hmm. of tourism initially. Of course, now they're encouraging it, mm -hmm. but then they, they discouraged it, and 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 then they wanted to attract Western tourists because they saw all this, but they wanted to impose what the Western tourist is supposed to get out of what they see. Mm. So through the labeling of objects mm. and, and mm. sites, they would be told an, uh, an, an, authorita an, an authoritative mm. story mm. approved by the Communist Party. And of course, for an American tourist, what we struggle is to find our own little view mm. of it. In other words, that, that place around the corner that nobody goes, or mm. that view of the canyon which reveals ancient Indian artifacts that the Park Service representative missed, you know, didn't, out, missed on, out, yes, out on, right? Yes. And so we want to make the tourist site our own. Yeah. So yeah, actually, yeah. this well, actually we can define the narrative as opposed to exactly. giving the script. Like yes. The people should define the yeah, narrative, yeah. right? And 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 uh, the Chinese government has been struggling with that because it keeps <laughs> wanting to define the narrative. Yeah. So one of the things it's doing is there were towns that were simply bypassed, and they won't even be tertiary cities. Uh, mm -hmm. They they're still uh, marginalized on the fringes here and there. Mm -hmm. And so what they're developing them as is, is inter internal uh, tourist sites. So, so if more you, for the it, internal yes, Chinese if you, market. Yes, if yeah. you have a walled city and the walled city is still intact, what they're going to do in the interior of that walled city is they won't allow high, high buildings. They'll have relatively intimate family lodging, mm. and they'll just have regular kind of restaurants and shops, mm. but regular in the sense of tourist, yes. but for Chinese tourists. Yeah, yeah. And I, we were at several of them, mm. a couple of them, and they, they were very nice. They were not Chinese that we could see, mm. in that they were like a curio shop in Disneyland. Mm. That is, they were stuff from other parts of China that don't have any connection yeah. to the region. They're not local crafts or things like that. Mm. And there seems to be a lot of that, but on the other hand, uh, especially in the non-Han parts of China, uh, Lijiang in particular. Mm -hmm. Lijiang is like the Yosemite, the Yellowstone of, mm. of China. And when if you say those words, you say Lijiang, you know, Chinese, well, oh, <laughs> oh, I've always wanted to go there. Because the air is pure, it's high altitude. Yeah. And the Beautiful old, the old city, the, the, the modern city was destroyed but the, uh, by an earthquake, but the old city uh, is UNESCO. Mm. And there's actually a feeling, although it's all hotels and things like that, there's some survival. This is kind of the way we'd like to see Hawaii, yeah. that we want to be able to cater to every tourist, but we still want some authentic yeah. experience, or at least of who we really are, mm -hmm. as opposed to what people think Hawaii is. Yeah. And that's a, an interesting way of looking at it, because yeah. so we're going to have a flood of Chinese tourists, mm -hmm. uh, who really, this is one of the big growth areas. Yeah. So now we have a lot of Japanese tourists, but their economy isn't doing so well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but we are going to have a different kind of tourist. Yeah, uh, Chinese yeah. tourists don't like being having their flights canceled. Mm -hmm. And 
and uh, they can. The Cultural Revolution taught everyone: if you don't push for something, you're not going to get it. Resources are scarce; you've got to fight. Yeah. And so we may not have the kind of polite Japanese Dato, tourists that yes, we used to have uh, in, in, in the Chinese. But on the other hand, you know, Chinese are very respectful people yeah. on the whole, just yeah. as we are. And we, we could expect a very good experience, I think, with the yes. overall Chinese. Uh, and in a few cases, suitcases full of cash ready to buy something. Well, we're, we're fine <laughs> with that, happening. only it's our cash, yes. you know, oh, in, in right. essence. Yeah, so it's yeah. something to think about. Oh, it's fascinating. Well, this has been a great conversation, Mark. I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to really learn and uh, reflect on some of your recent travels there. And, you know, China, a country that, you know, gosh, we, we need to understand. It's not going away. It's been there and it will continue to be a key player for us. And certainly for those of you who, again, have not had the opportunity, uh, we need to stay engaged. Just as they're learning more about us, we need to be connecting our ourselves more there uh, and that's what we're doing here in Global Connections kind of bringing the world here but also those of us here in the, in the US who are connected to the world sharing some of those reflections so we're out of time and we have to wrap it up here I'm um, Carlos Juarez and this is Global Connections in the Think Tech radio series we've been talking with Mark Gilbert here about China and world history and maybe some of the just dramatic changes unfolding in that important country I want to thank you all for being here I want to thank also the Production manager Ian Montoya, oh, Montana, sorry, uh, communications director Chrissy Goffigan, and of course Jay Fidel, who helps bring it all together. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for listening, because after all, uh, that's what we're here about. Uh, Think Tech will be back next week uh, for the show of our Think Tech series, so please stay tuned. And maybe if you want to get our daily emails or our social media advisories, make sure to click the link on thinktechhawaii.com. And if you'd like to be a guest or a sponsor or a Think Tech underwriter, be sure and contact Jay at thinktech. Hawaii.com. Thank you so much, and remember we broadcast live on the internet at 2 and at 4 every weekday, and all of our shows are streamed live as well. Uh, if you want links to those or podcasts, go to thinktechhawaii.com. And of course, I'll see you here next week for more of Global Connections. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>